to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that top smart. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. Violence, more money into art. We can investigate what policies. If we're going to have some real healing, we've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. And welcome to... Buffalo, what's next? Thanks very much for joining us this morning. I'm Jay Moran. We're going to be talking about entrepreneurship this morning. And with us, uh, we have um, Sonia Terake. She's uh, with uh, e for all Buffalo. She's the program manager. And also with us, a former member of the Buffalo Bills and community director for Entrepreneurs Forever, Marlon Kerner. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, this is uh, an interesting approach thing because as we've started the show in the last um, couple of months, a lot of the, this has come up in conversation with community members. The lack of in the inner city, especially the east side of Buffalo, mm-hmm. businesses that are finding ways to get started or to thrive. Mm-hmm. So we have an opportunity now maybe to look at the grassroots of things and how things can start. Let's first just talk about the different organizations because though they're you're somewhat under the same umbrella, you have different mm-hmm. uh, elements to it. So, start with uh, Sonia. Uh, start right. with about e for all Buffalo. Ladies first, I guess. Of course. Always. <laughs> always. 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 Yeah. All right. So I love that introduction because I feel the solutions are already there. And so e for all is a national organization. So it started in 2010 and it just came to Buffalo last year. So we haven't even been here for a year yet. But the solution that e for all brings and the gap that it fills, we were just talking to 43 North about this, is that we cater to small mom and pop shops. We're looking to bring Main Street back to life. Main Street, Seneca, Sycamore, those streets on the east side that you're describing because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll develop and we'll bring and we'll outsource talent when talent is really right here. So the beauty of e for all is what we offer is for free. All of our programs are at no charge. So we'll offer pitch contests and business accelerator programs. So let's say you just have an idea. You want to own your own restaurant right there. You want to be the next Rachel's. <laughs> okay, well, Rachel's right. had to figure it out when they started. They didn't have a program like this to help them out. So what we'll do is instead of you giving, a, giving you a key to a storefront and saying, figure it out, we'll put folks through an intensive 12-week curriculum. And then once we've gotten through that curriculum, legal, finances, taxes, insurance, then we'll go forward to potentially get them a storefront and again at no charge then once they get to a place where they're establishing recurring revenue we'll pass them along to marlin's program e forever and i'll let him describe a little bit more about that yeah please so entrepreneurs forever is also new to the community Um, we came in about three months after e for all launched last year in april Mm -hmm. or so Um, so i just completed my first year um, with the organization Um, but we form the wraparound support that I like to call it. Um, so where e for all will do the ideation and the startup um, to help you launch your business, we come in and look for existing business owners, right? Like so those people that already jumped in it, didn't have a clue, but just took the plunge anyway, and then realized, hey, I need more support. I need some help. I need to kind of figure out how to take my business to the next level. We look for those businesses. Um, so while we don't traditionally try to say we're going to seek out tech only businesses, we look for those mom and pops. We provide that same support looking for people, those owners in the community, um, trying to re-envision what their business could look like, trying to help their communities reestablish and and kind of make it look like some of the surrounding suburbs, um, like you would go if you were in East Aurora, like a Main Street type of strip like that. Um, we're in that process of looking um, to help those business owners. Uh, and the way we do that is using a peer-to-peer model. Um, so we will bring 10 to 12 business um, owners together, Uh, And then we put them in a cohort um, or a peer group, as you like to call it, uh, and we give you a curriculum um, that will last for three years. And so one of the biggest differences in what we saw is is if you're already in that business um, and you like, hey, I need some training, we can't give you the same water hose effect that you might get if you're in a startup. Um, So we understand that you need to still run your business. So we take a little longer um, to make sure you still get the the training and the curriculum that you need. Uh, So that's how we approach it that way. Um, We we like to say we give you two hours a month to work on your business instead of always working in your business. Looking forward to talking to both of you about uh, the different experiences that you're finding with business owners or prospective business owners. But I want to get just a little bit more into the organization because these are uh, 
501c3s, right? So, yes, sir. And they're part of what, the Mansman Foundation? Is that right? Yes, Entrepreneurs Forever is part of the Mansman Foundation. So our founder, his name was Joe Callahan. Okay. Uh, and he's we're a Pittsburgh-based organization. Uh, and so he was a member of a peer group for 37 years. Um, so he was a member of Young President's Organization. Uh, and mm -hmm. to be a member of there, you have to now have $13 million in revenue. Um, so he took multiple businesses from the ideation phase all the way through to that multi-million dollar level. Uh, and as he was looking to kind of say, what is my legacy like? And why did I have the success I had? He had this epiphany of my peer group, the network, the people that I was able to go and seek advice from and just talk through challenges that I might be facing really helped solidify where his business went and the direction that he should go to make it become more successful. Uh, and because of that, he said, what if my local community had that same type of support? What if the mom and pop business that was down the street who are going to, if they grow, they're going to pull from the community. So now everyone wins because the business is thriving. We're hired from within our community. So everyone is winning. If they had the same type of support, what would their businesses and what would our communities look like? And that's how we were born. We were born out of that idea. Um, and he said, we're going to figure this out. He left us um, seed money to get started. Um, and so we went from Pittsburgh to Massachusetts to Buffalo did back up to um, Rhode Island, and now I'm um, also the community director for Erie. So I'm headed to Erie, Pennsylvania as well. Yeah, any sure. particular reason though why, why Buffalo, why these particular communities? I think it was the partnership that we ended up coming together to form with E for All, um, E for All, Boston, uh, Massachusetts based. Um, so kind of figuring out where they were, um, what communities they already existed in, made it easy for us to kind of say, hey, we can kind of expand and support what you've already done. And then we found, formed a partnership to enter new communities in together to figure out how, what that looks like. So mm -hmm. together we come and we start a new community and it's E for all, entrepreneurs forever, with that same hope of they're going to get you started with the ideation part of it, um, get you up and running, and also do pitch contests to help give you some seat money. And then when you're ready to join our program, it's a natural transition of I get a lot of support, and then I get more support in a little less way, a little less hectic way to run your business, but still the same type of support that you need to continue to grow your business. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who's been paying attention, Buffalo's been on the rise. I right. got here in 2013, and I've watched for the last 10 years, and it's what's convinced me to stay, is every time I turn around, there's a new program, a new you know opportunity, not just for entrepreneurs, but for you know tech companies and small businesses. So for e for all I mean, Desh Deshpande is our founder. He actually started Deshpande Foundation. And like anybody else, he was frustrated with the way nonprofits were set up. And he said, if I start one, I'm going to run it like a company. And that's what he did. And so e for all functions very much like a corporate headquarters because we see it as, listen, you're an entrepreneur. You stop giving free services. Charge what you are worth. And so a lot of it is just instilling that self-confidence of someone will pay you for your work because you're afraid that if you stay with your nine to five, that's security, that's stability. If I give that up, What's waiting for me? Is it the best? There's no safety net waiting there for to catch them, and that's sort of what we provide. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that. You know, you've seen Buffalo uh, rise here in the time that you've been here. Can you describe that or, or get into some sort of examples of, of what you think? Am I being a Buffalo guy? I, mean, I always <laughs> want to believe that some things are going great, but uh, but you come in with a little different perspective. You you come here, you get your MBA. So you have uh, that business um, mm -hmm. analyst type of uh, perspective. So what, mm -hmm. what are you seeing? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you my personal experience. So like I said, I came back in 2013. I was The plan was to get my degree, go back to New York City, and work on Wall Street because that's where things are happening. And then as I started to stay in Buffalo, I started noticing that there were programs available that would give me the time of day. I'm 26 now, but when I started, that I wouldn't have been able to do in New York City. I can be on a board of directors, which I've, I'm on several right now, because I'm in Buffalo and the opportunities are there. I can start a company. Like I said, I co-founded an e-learning platform called Real Talk, and we secured $100,000 in investment funding. I can do that because I'm here in Buffalo. With e for all I have we have 84 applications just for 15 spots, and we're able, we're hopefully going to be able to expand that number of, of communities we can serve. So the demand is here, the opportunities are here, but it's a lot more accessible. And so I think that it's a little bit easier in Buffalo to get your foot in the door versus where I'm from, where there's literally millions of people. 
Yeah, that's interesting to hear that you got that kind of seed money. And I'm wondering, is, is that something that you're finding, that people are mm-hmm. finding those mm-hmm. opportunities around here? That Funding. I mean, because you got to have money, right? you gotta right. to you get, got to money to get things rolling. Is it, But that it's available, you say? Absolutely. And even for our EFRA entrepreneurs, if you want a storefront, sometimes you need someone to co-sign for you and you don't have that person necessarily. And so here you have folks who are willing to give you a chance. So let's say you come through our program and you need a bakery. But you don't have good credit. That's another thing we talk about in our <laughs> right. You got to have some goods. Right. You have to have somebody co-sign for you. And that's where we provide with our investment arm as well and E-Forever as well. Yeah. What, what about then maybe throw the, 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 the ice water on this for just a second? <laughs> I, I've got an idea. I want to be, you know, I want to open up a bakery. I want to do this or that. But what about the reality of it all? Mm-hmm. How to work your way through it? What, what, I mean, I'm curious, how, maybe some of the people that you're hearing from, either mm-hmm. people are frustrated that they can't get going or maybe they just need like, Like I said, they need a cold, hard slap of reality on their face. Absolutely. I provide that. (laughs) Marlon does it in a nicer way, so I'll let you start. (laughs) You know, (laughs) my approach is probably more of, uh, like, when I came in and took this role, I think the first thing I did, like any former athlete would do, is I'm going to get a scouting report, right? How do we play nice in the sandbox, so to speak? Like, where do we fit in the ecosystem? So... um, having a lot of other experience in a lot of other areas and not necessarily saying, I'm going to, I've started a business yet. Um, I plan to do that soon. Um, I figured out, I needed to figure out what resources were available. Um, So that was the first thing I did. And as Sonia said, there's a lot here. Um, And I think that's one of the things that I've heard so much from so many people who want to start a business is I'm not sure how to start, right? So I was like, okay, let's take the first question. I have an idea. I'm not even sure if that's a business idea or not. How do I start? How do I figure out if this side hustle can be a permanent thing that I can do to leave my nine to five. So I just kind of went through and said, who does what, um, who's where, um, so that when I have that conversation with you, I can say, well, we're not for you right now, but you should go talk to this person. Uh, and so already knowing um, about e I understood where they were, acceleration, uh, accelerated programs they have, but then they also have that you can come in and be like, hey, I've got pitch contests. I can do those things, right? So if it's, I just kind of figure out I need to do a pitch contest to get practice. Great, we have one of those. Or I'm not sure they take 15 every six months, so you should talk to Sonia um, or Juaria, mm-hmm. right? Um, but then there was Weedy um, that we can talk to. There was mm-hmm. the Women Business Center um, at Canisius that you can talk to. There's a Small Business Development Center. Um, so it's just kind of figuring out, there's Launch in um, New York, and just kind of figuring out, all right, who does what, who plays where, who does this? Um, you know, some people have, I have an idea, I've already fleshed it out. Um, there's SCORE um, that also does free um, support for big people that want to kind of figure out how to start a business. So I just kind of started like jotting down and figuring out who does what, who plays where. And then you talked about some people like, hey, I just need, I don't know how to do it. How do I get funding? What's the, what, what are traditional ways? What are non-traditional ways? Like mm-hmm. depending on what type of business you have, it may be considered a traditional business and you can go and get a traditional business loan for it. Some of them are not. Um, and so then how do you go get alternative lending if your credit is not the best, right? <laughs> so then I found about Pursuit. <laughs> and you start looking at all those places and Pathstone, right? And, and just people that will do different type of lendings um, for you if your credit is not there, if you can't secure a traditional business loan um, and if you can't go to like your, your key banks, your M&T banks, um, for example. So that's where I started. And then I was able to really provide a comprehensive plan and a blueprint of let's start here. You're in the ideation phase. OK, you need to go see my friends over here. You're an existing business. We should have another conversation of where you are. Where is your income revenue? according to our own requirements. Um, and then have you been in business for at least a year? Uh, and then we can talk. Um, and then we kind of figure out what the next steps are for you and if our program is the best fit. If not, then we find the right resource for you. So let's follow up on that then when it comes to funding, because that is a big thing. And again, one of those things that we're hearing that in certain parts of the city of Buffalo, funding is not necessarily available through traditional banks. So you're mm-hmm. saying that there are other opportunities for people who want to get into business. Mm-hmm. There are other sources for them to to seek out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for example, Kathy just passed the Eastside Economic Development Fund, which is about $65 million. Now, a lot of that is going to construction projects, but there is $7 million of that budget allocated strictly for community programs. So not necessarily like an E-for-all because we have our own funding and we do our own fundraising. But let's say I was just fundraising for that bakery. Then I could tap in and say, hey, I would love a grant for $25,000 or United Way, where you have to have a minimum ask of $30,000 just for them to even talk to you. So 
it just depends on how much you're looking for, and then we can connect you with the right resource. But Marlon's a lot nicer than I am. I like to ask the screening questions of, are you looking for just cash? Because if your answer to me is why you want to pursue entrepreneurship because I want a yacht, <laughs> I'm not your girl. But if you're looking to you know, impact your community and uplift and create generational wealth, that's really what we're here to do. And let's make sure we get uh, some contact information out. Now, we'll repeat it before the end of the program as well. But so because I think all that we've already talked about here, I can almost sense that people are listening and saying, I want to I want to check this mm -hmm. out because I've already maybe mm -hmm. given up on the idea that my side hustle mm -hmm. is never going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. How where, where should they go to, to mm -hmm. find out more information? Well, now that we can actually be outside again, <laughs> <laughs> you can meet both Mar Marlon, myself, and Jaweria Dahir, our executive director, on August 24th oh. at Dig Buffalo at 640 Ellicott Street downtown. And it's going to be our Simple Steps How to Start a Business event. So we're going to have folks tabling, vending, and it'll be a great introduction. So if you want to meet us in person, August 24th, and if you want to apply virtually, then just go to eforall.org slash uh, buffalo. Um, back to the, the, just carrying on then the, the funding. Like you said, the, it's mm -hmm. interesting you know, about uh, the governor releasing that money for east side development. Mm -hmm. So you say, what, $7 million okay. is available? The idea that it could be seed money or mm -hmm. money that could help out businesses that already exist. Right. And it's looking for community and grassroots initiatives. So if you're trying to open a Subway franchise, <laughs> maybe it's not for you. And they give you that blueprint. Right. This is someone who's really starting from scratch. Like there's an organization local called Community Garden Party by uh, Arrington. Uh, Ely. And what they do is they're pretty much trying to create sort of like what Alexander Wright does with his food co-ops, sure. but they're trying to kind of franchise that out. So that's an opportunity. It would be a fit for someone like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And how about what you see when you're going out and traveling about? Mm -hmm. We talk about empty storefronts on Main Street, lots of empty space on Jefferson Avenue right now. Do you see opportunity where others maybe uh, see I don't know. Uh, call mm -hmm. it what you want. Uh, emptiness <laughs> and, you know, you know, nothing happening here. I mean, I'm wondering about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think having the ability to travel all around um, and not just in the city of Buffalo, like I can go all over. Um, and I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, so down in Jamestown, I think there is this renaissance that's happening um, in the the entrepreneur ecosystem. Right. There's, there's a lot of resources. Um, so it's now just connecting people with the right individuals to kind of help them make their vision into a reality. Uh, and so having been able to go back and forth there in Erie and see some of the similarities of empty storefronts, buildings all over, and then just really helping people see it from a different point of view, right? Like helping people understand that that is a great idea. Like, let's talk about that. We may need to revise that, right? So helping people not so much get tied to the, I have a specific blueprint of how it should look, but helping them understand take some mentors along the way, uh, mm -hmm. and then maybe we can talk about it. Um, and it needs to be a conversation between the person who is going to be running that business and then their mentors as well. Um, so you can have that back and forth. And some things you're going to say, I agree with it. Some things you're not. Um, but that's really what I've been seeing a lot of is people just kind of really trying to take the advice. But there's so many resources, as we were talking about before, it's just making sure you have the right one. Like there was grants for people that, that are existing um, business owners um, that you can get storefront grants. Uh, and I, I probably have the wrong name for it. But there's grants out there to help you transform the way your the front your storefront looks, right? So you can get make it uh, look a certain way. You can make everything look uniform. And, and that's all over um, the state of New York. So mm -hmm. just kind of figuring out where you fit. Um, if you're an existing business for us, that's what we deal with. So helping people point to the right resources to get them there. Um, but yes, I, I, I see that there's a this new way to try to change the way we look. Um, and, and we're going away from all of the big chains, right? And trying to bring in more mm -hmm. mom and pop businesses and helping helping those communities thrive because that's what makes it that's what makes it stronger when you look at the communities. When you look at the east side, that's what's been missing the most um, is right. there's not a lot of businesses, right? Um, and I think it – when I always think about why did it get this way, right? Like you always think like, well, how did it get there? And and growing up in Ohio, I see a lot of similarities. Um, and, and I laugh now because I'm like, you know what? We push so much about college, 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 and mm. we never talk about, hey, there's an alternative path. You can be an entrepreneur, 
right? And I think that it starts with this generation now, high school, talking about entrepreneurship and what that looks like um, and, a, and a tr an alternative path. Like, you know, even the trades, um, you can be an entrepreneur and have a trade mm -hmm. business. Certainly. And people don't even think like that. Like, there's a lot of plumbers that started in a, in a trade program and then came out and said, I'm going to start my own business. Mm -hmm. um, and so they took the leap. And I look for those guys. So if there's any plumbers or electricians listening, reach out to me. <laughs> <laughs> but those, I mean, those are ways to have your own business. And so we need to really make that look a lot better. I'm an, I'm a former athlete. So I was group like, I want to be an, I want to be an athlete. I want to be an athlete. But there are other paths to be successful. And I think we need to really start focusing on how to make and, and those, those pathways more attractive. Um, mm -hmm. And not just like go for the fast bucks. Like you can make a, a really good money. You might not make it at first starting out, but if you do your business and build it the correct way and grow and scale according to your own abilities, and if you don't know how to grow that, find the right person um, that can help you get to where you want to go. You can become a very successful entrepreneur, and there are people that want to help you be successful along the way. These are good words. We're going to take a time out. We're going to come back with more on Buffalo What's Next. Our guests this morning, uh, Sonia Terrake and also Marlon Kerner. This is a time out. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. It's one thing to love public media, but it's a special thing to support it. Consider this. If you've got a car you don't need anymore, or you've got one that's simply too expensive to repair, arrange to donate it to Buffalo Toronto Public Media. It's easy for you, pickup is free, and it could be worth hundreds of dollars in support. Here's how to get started. Go to WNED.org slash vehicles. Watch the WNED PBS original production, The Great Erie County Fair. We were brought up on the fair. You know, that was the place to go, the thing to see. Celebrate 175 years of the excitement and competitive spirit of the fair, The Great Erie County Fair. Now streaming on YouTube and the PBS video app. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And welcome back to Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran with us, uh, Marlon Kerner, Community Director for Entrepreneurs Forever, and also... Uh, Sonia Tarake, the program manager for E for All Buffalo. Uh, Marlon got us into something just before we went to break here, the idea about hitting up kids in high school with the idea that you know college might not be exactly the path you're looking for. You may have a certain mm -hmm. spirit about you that you know maybe a liberal arts degree isn't exactly what you need or even an engineering degree, whatever the case may be. What about that? What, what about trying to mold that message mm -hmm. earlier on. Right. I'll jump in for this one. So a little bit of family background. So uh, my parents, both mom and dad, are from Ethiopia, which is in East Africa. And so they both emigrated here in the 90s. And so college was sort of the only path available okay. to me. And if I didn't take it, I was a failure. So I took the college path, but I also pursued entrepreneurship on the side just to be able to say, look, I did what you wanted, but then I also am pursuing my dreams on the side. A lot of us get caught up in that. So a get example in Buffalo, there's a school tapestry over on Great Arrow Ave. Yep. And they came to us and said, look, our kids, we've just had them remote for two years, and now we're bringing them back into the classroom, and we're expecting them to just sit down. They can't turn their camera off anymore and pay attention for eight periods. And so they're saying, we want to learn uh, how to own our own makeup company. We want to own our own hair salon. We want to own our own Etsy shop. We don't want to go to college. And there's no curriculum for that because that's what all the only thing college advisors are trained to give you. So we came in and we started an e for, an e for all club. So every Monday, once a month, the first Monday of every month, I'll go in and I'll do a different theme. It'll be legal one month. It'll be real estate another month, marketing another month. And then I'll just have a group of kids and say, well, what do you want to start? And then they'll say, man, I wish we had this in our curriculum. And so I talked to the principal, and so we're going to try and start an entrepreneurship class this fall. We just got to work out the scheduling details. But that's something that we should integrate within the high schools because then we have a pipeline. So when you come to me, I can only accept e for all applicants who are age 18 and up. 
But what if you're not prepared? What if I had just taken that four years in high school so you could hit the ground running when you came in as, a, as an 18 year old? So we're doing that now. But I, I hope that that narrative gets pushed a lot more because, like Marlon said, there are trade schools available. It's not just liberal arts college because sometimes those liberal arts degrees don't pay the bills and you end up having to get a trade anyway. So you might as well start <laughs> <Yes>. early. <laughs> You know, I'm interested. Um, I, I've been thinking a little about this, having you come in, Marlon. Of course, uh, uh, very familiar with your career here in Buffalo. And, you know, you're, you grew up in Columbus. You went to The Ohio State University, of course, and then came here and played. Uh, what about that young Marlon Kerner, that 18-year-old? Was he already looking ahead to life beyond football? Uh, and because I, I think about the opportunities. I, I've been fortunate enough to know a lot of uh, local college athletes. Um, great kids, but... I don't necessarily think they're thinking beyond their days on the playing field or the or the playing court. Mm. You know, I can safely say that I was not thinking like that. I, I came into thinking that the NFL was a career, and it's not. It is just a passing point. It's a launch pad for what you're going to do mm. for the later point of your life. Like So, you know, having gone into player engagement space, it made me really understand that this is a business. Uh, and so even piggyback on, piggybacking on what uh, Sonia just said, I, I think even all athletes should take some entrepreneurial courses, um, especially with the onset of NIL and how that changes because a lot of athletes don't look at themselves as entrepreneurs, but you are a business. Um, you have to make business decisions, um, even at a young age, right? Like. Am I going to sacrifice hanging out with my friends to go get up and work out and train and do certain things? And so at an early age, you're making business decisions. You're the CEO. Um, and so you have to make sure who what you're watching out, who you hang out with. You're making sure that you watch out what you put into your body. Those are all business decisions. Um, and so you're trying to make and create this narrative of I'm a really good athlete while also taking care of everything you need to take care of in the classroom. Uh, and so we don't think of it as I'm a business um, and then with social media, I'm thankful I didn't have social media. <laughs> but Me too. <laughs> you now have a brand like your brand is a business. And so now, you know, athletes don't understand. Some get it. Yep. Um, some get it when they get to college because they have the right people around them and say, hey, you're a brand. You're a business. You need to make sure you do X, Y and Z. If you do this, you become more marketable. That's a business. And so you need to make sure you approach it that way and you're making business decisions. And if you're fortunate enough to be the the one percent that actually makes it to the next level um, all right great but the average NFL career is three and a half years mm. so I was that guy like I played four seasons double ACL and I'm 25 like what am I gonna do next right like mm. that transition is real uh, and so sometimes athletes don't think like this is a short time um, to be in my life and even if you got to play 10 12 13 years I always go and talk to guys like listen you're what 21 now so let's say you played 13 years. You're 34. Mm. What are you going to do for the next 30 years? Well, what do you mean? Right. Mm. Like you have 30 years before you actually officially retire and hit the retirement age according to America and what our standards are. So what are you going to do after that? Oh, I never thought of it that way. Mm. Right. So kind of help guys figure out like entrepreneur. And a lot of athletes will do that. They'll start their own businesses. Um, and so that's why this became very, very important to me because – I get to go find those guys, former athletes like myself, who are like, hey, I want to start a business or I've already started a business and I'm not sure what the next steps are um, and how to get there. Uh, and so that's what's, that was really what was appealing to us um, and how we do it um, with our curriculum and what we cover. I think it's, it's unique um, and different from some of the other programs that are out there. And what about that, Sonia, the idea? I, I love that. that you are a business. Now, you're talking about an athlete, mm -hmm. but but it's a, it's a – it's – it sounds almost like a spirit that that everybody kind of every young person really needs to have to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And I would think even more so if you're coming out of, you know, you're a person of color, you're coming out mm -hmm. of a, maybe a difficult uh, a background mm -hmm. where and, you know, the statistics say it right here in Buffalo mm -hmm. about where you might end up if you tried mm -hmm. to follow a traditional path. Mm -hmm. What about de developing that spirit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of times when I was in high school, I would always hear about the school to prison pipeline. Mm. And so you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around. And so if you hang around with the wrong crowd, you'll end up just like them. And we'll think, oh, not me, not me. There's always that attitude of I'm the exception to the rule. And that's not necessarily always the case. So there's a book that I read. It's called The Startup of You by one of the founders of LinkedIn. 
mentioned. And he was talking about exactly what you're describing, Marlon, that you are a business. And so the folks that we serve at E4ALL, primarily immigrants, minority-owned businesses, women, like you said, people of color, and previously incarcerated. That's another group that we forget about here, which is a huge number. Thankfully, Joe Biden established April a second chance month because we have, what, two million people in prisons? And a lot of folks could have avoided that way because it's a key set of years, let's say 15 to 18, where folks are getting into some trouble. Whereas if we had just took them over to the side, the same person at 15 is a completely different person at 31. It's just sure. a key set yes. of years we're talking about where, of course, you get into trouble. So I think with EFRAL, the, the, the gap that's there is that we don't get them early enough. And that's why we started this EFRAL. Even though saying, hey, 19, maybe I've already missed. Maybe I lost you in that key set of years where I was supposed to pull you to the side and say, look, this is an opportunity for you. And so with Buffalo, there's a flip to everything. And we talked about this renaissance that's been going on for 10 years. But wherever there's good, there's always a bad side. And so when you talk about development and, and, and re-establishing you know, establishing and bringing back Buffalo, there's also the flip side of that, which is gentrification and displacement. So when we talk about why can't these storefronts get filled – how much does it cost to get some of these storefronts? If you look at Elmwood or Hurdle, the same square footage, let's say you're paying $5,000 a month in rent to be on, on Hurdle Ave, you're getting a square footage of probably 1,500 square feet. That amount on Seneca Street, you could get a 13,000 square feet space for $5,000 a month. So certain neighborhoods where the business corridors already exist are a little too pricey for folks to get in. And so that's where we kind of come in to say, hey, we'll back you. There's also a project going on in Niagara Falls, New York. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but Blue Cardinal Capital, they're redeveloping Main Street in Niagara Falls because Niagara Falls is another city like Buffalo where you right. drive through and there's so much that used to be there that isn't there anymore. And so they have about 38 buildings and they're going to redevelop it and they're going to hopefully create another Main Street and kind of bring it back to life. So it's going on around us. It's just that we need to have it happen here in Buffalo. So I'm excited to to, to be part of that change. And we're talking, uh, on your side, it's more people are ready to get started or want to get started. Marlon, mm -hmm. you're talking more to businesses who want to try to get to the next step. And we talked a, a little bit about this peer-to-peer -peer, um, concept that, that goes on here. You, what, you put together, what, non-competing businesses to, to try to talk to each other, to try to give each other um, guidance moving forward? Exactly. Um, so we look to find 10 to 12 um, entrepreneurs um, and we always try to make sure they're not competing businesses. Now, we won't say no to friends that might be in the same industry um, and say, hey, we want to be in the same peer group. That's the only exception we'll make. Um, but we, you, you're going to come in and grow with that group. Um, so you might call it a cohort. We call it a peer group. Um, th that's probably the best way to describe it. And that group stays the same. Um, so it's not a revolving door. It's not, hey, you're 10, go, and then you know, this one changes from week to week. It's this group grows. Um, I liked being a big sports guy. I like to call it a sports locker room because okay. um, <laughs> that's what you, anybody that plays Does sports. Does everybody relate to that, though? Even a lot of people do because yeah. anybody that plays sports understands mm -hmm. that when we talk about being done, like nobody misses practices, like nobody misses <laughs> two-a-days. Nobody, like you, you might miss the cheering from the games, but you don't miss that. What you really miss the most is the camaraderie. You miss the guys or the girls in that locker room that you can go and say, man, I had a rough night. Night or I'm have I had a bad practice and they're gonna put their arm around you like it's okay I've been there you know let's let's pick it up what can we do to make tomorrow better right like so that's what we're trying to offer we're trying to create that type of environment where those entrepreneurs can then go and say you know what man this is a rough month I I, I don't know what to do my advertising is down my revenue is down and the entrepreneur next to you may say I went through the same thing last year I went through the same thing six months ago and here's what I did I I, I talked to this person or I, I did this on Twitter or I did this on Instagram or I, I started and picked up TikTok or I met a marketing agent and they helped me come up with a marketing plan right so all those things that you talk about because as an entrepreneur um, you wear a lot of hats and if you're a solopreneur um, you're all the hats, right? You're you're HR, you're marketing, you're you're doing the hiring, the firing, the cleaning, you're opening, you're the cashier, you're the stalker, <laughs> right, you're the cleaner. Right, right. Like you do all those things. And so it can get very lonely because you feel like you're always doing something in your business. And yet you had this business plan that if you got a traditional loan, you had to create a business plan mm -hmm. to help say, I'm going to do this, this, this. So you had a plan of in year one, I'm going to do this. In year two, I'm going to do that. But what ends up happening with a lot of solopreneurs is you end up having to do all the day-to-day -day stuff that you don't have time to go back and revisit your plan. So sometimes you feel like you're off. right? And so this allows you to get with a lot of other people that may be experiencing the same thing. 
Um, and then you can say, as we always like to say, um, we, we say we had, we, you got this because we got you. That's our, our catchphrase. <laughs> but I like to say we, we're going to give you an opportunity to work on your business instead of working always in your business. Because that's what ends up happening is you do a lot of working in your business instead of always stepping back and doing a high level deep dive into, am I on track? Are my revenues where it should be? Is my pricing structure the best that it should be? Am I charging too much? Am I charging too less? Um, what happens if this happens? Am I ready to hire an individual? Do I trust the people that I want to hire or bring in? Like those are all questions that a lot of entrepreneurs will have. Um, and so we're able to kind of talk about some of those topics. Um, and if you don't have a vision, we, we also, that's one of our, our, our components of our curriculum is mm -hmm. helping you help have a, and develop a clear vision of where you want to take your business because mm -hmm. things change. And you may have thought your business was going one way and you may need to pivot and change that vision. Um, and we can help talk you through that mm -hmm. um, with that group um, and we also have a trained facilitator. I think that's one thing that I forgot to mention mm -hmm. is, okay. is you're not by yourself. We have a trained Somebody facilitator. Somebody who understands the bigger picture. That understands the bigger picture. Um, and that was also an entrepreneur themselves. Um, so they either still own the business or they are now retired and sold their business. So they're leading you through this conversation um, and mm -hmm. these discussions, understanding that I've gone through the same thing that you're going through. And here's how I helped solve it. Here's a resource that got me through. Here's something you might want to consider. So it really is something that really is different um, for existing entrepreneurs. And because we come in with E4All, it's also a free program as well. Now, what about, are you out recruiting businesses for to be involved here? Or do they <laughs> find so you? There's so much huh? door knocking that goes on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, hello, knock on the door, come talk to me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Coffee shops everywhere. And, uh, and Marlon touched on something that was huge. When you're going out and you're recruiting, there's this idea of competition versus camaraderie that we always come up against. And so a lot of times when you're going to a small business, sometimes, things aren't all on the books sometimes sure. there's some under the table stuff going on and you coming in as a third party saying well I'm going to help you well <laughs> who are you and in the suit so <laughs> right right I don't so that's huge when you're recruiting is kind of just getting it to know someone as a person and building a relationship and saying hey don't apply to our program but come meet us at our simple steps event and then just get to know us and then if you like what you see then you apply if not then we're not a fit for you so knowing that we're not for everybody but for those who, who actually believe in what we're doing, it, it'll naturally be a fit. So that trust piece is huge because the problem that we have in our community, specifically the black community, is that we'll we see it trust. as competition, not camaraderie. It's about there's one pie, and if I don't get my slice, I will never get anything. And there's, there's enough to go around. And that's a huge piece of what we do is it's not a competition. You're a cohort. Lean on each other. You find that, Marlon? Oh, yeah, yeah. I find that a lot. I, I, and I think being... In the ecosystem, I, I think that was the first thing that I encountered. Um, there's scarcity of resources, right? Like Certainly. everyone's competing for different types of funds that you can provide um, for the entrepreneurs in our in our ecosystem. And so the first thing that I did, which is really important to me, was to get to know all the players in the ecosystem because we're talking about the not trusting um, with the entrepreneurs, but there's also this almost like a distrust among the people that provide the resources um, because mm -hmm. it's like, you're taking my people from me or you might be taking resources from my me. Applicant. So it was very important for me to come in and establish trust with the people that are in the space. Um, like I remember... Um, there was a, a person that I was recruiting, um, and he was also in another program. I won't mention the program, but I knew the person uh, who was in the program. And so before we even had another conversation, I was like, let me reach out to the person that you're in um, and let them know that you might be considering us. And I want to make sure there's no level of conflict, if anything, whatsoever, because I would never want to have somebody feel like I'm taking a prospect away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I sent her an email and just kind of said, hey, just want to let you know I, I had a conversation with one of your 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 members. I saw an article. Um, we had a quick conversation. There seems like there may be some interest, but I know he's in your program, and I want to make sure that there's no conflict whatsoever. Uh, and she responded back graciously, like, thank you for, you know, that that email to let me know. I thank you for the professional courtesy that's there. Um, there is no conflict. If it's a good fit, he is more than welcome to do pro both programs. Um, and I'm like, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out that at that stage, he wasn't ready for our program yet. But I wanted to always make sure that there's always this level of professionalism that I always exude because I don't want anybody to feel like, I'm taking somebody from them because then there's no there's the openness is not there. And then mm -hmm. once we create that type of environment, the people that suffer the most is not me or the other organization. It's the entrepreneur. Right. Uh, and so I'm we're big on an entrepreneurs forever. 
doing more than one resource. So that's why it was very important also for me to learn what it was because while you're working with us once a month, I have no problem with you going to UB Center of um, uh, Entrepreneur Leadership, right? Or, or taking another program somewhere else. I encourage it um, because if you learn something else that maybe we haven't covered yet, you're going to share that with the group. And now the group becomes stronger. Uh, and so that was really important. But yeah, there's this scarcity. There's this mm -hmm. competition of, I got to get mine first. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. and, and, and Sonia also touched on the, the, the level of trust. What I found the most um, coming into black and brown communities is, is mm -hmm. um, because sometimes we haven't heard of it or because we've been burned before, mm -hmm. it takes longer um, for trust to be built. Yeah. Uh, and so I understood that coming in. So I didn't force anybody. I don't tell anybody, look, you got a limited amount of time. It's more of a, when you're ready, let me know. Let's hold it right there. We're going to take a break. I'm going to pick that up when we come back uh, on Buffalo What's Next. We have Marlon Kerner with us and Sonia Terrake, and this is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Watch the WNED PBS original production, Canadian Rockies by Rail. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome aboard the Rocky Mountaineer. You see that? We like to talk about trying to create life-changing experiences. Canadian Rockies by Rail, now streaming on YouTube, and the PBS video app. Hey, have you seen WNED PBS's Compact Science or Shakespeare's Greatest Hits? Here's five reasons to check them out. Compact Science is so fun, high energy, and educational that it won three prestigious awards, a communicator award, a telly, and an award from the New York State Broadcasters Association. And Shakespeare's Greatest Hits also received a communicator award and a telly for cinematically portraying some of Shakespeare's best monologues in bite-sized videos. Check them out at WNED.org or on YouTube. You're listening to Buffalo What's Next. There are several ways for you to join the conversation. Send us a message now on Twitter at WBFO. Email us at news at WBFO.org or just press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app and leave a comment we can use on the air. We're here for you. This is Buffalo What's Next. And thanks very much for joining us uh, this morning. I'm Jay Moran. With us uh, this morning, Marlon Kerner, Community Director for Entrepreneurs Forever, and also Sonia Terrake, Program Manager for e for all Buffalo. Uh, we went to break talking about trust issues when it comes to this idea about entrepreneurship and trying to get people to get on the same page where they're all um, rowing in the same direction, so to speak. Sony, what do you find in that regard? Mm -hmm. I heard someone say something once where you can make so much more money legally than illegally, but there's just so much extra red tape there and, and hoops you have to jump through. I mean, legal IRS taxes, sometimes we'll get folks on paper and they'll forget to pay their taxes. They'll say, it's my first year and I'm already delinquent. Like, dang, mm. can I get it? Can I catch a break? And we say, well, that's why you set a calendar reminder. That's structure. It's discipline that you have to build. So it's really just saying, hey, when you need to figure it out, I'll be there. And that's why the mentorship key, key is so peace because it, or piece is so key because what we'll do is for every business owner we'll give them three mentors so one of our business owner he uh he doesn't own a restaurant quite yet he cook he cooks out of his church's kitchen because okay. they, they allowed him to use the space for free so his three mentors one of them is a software engineer who is involved in the tech startup space another one is a small business banker at key bank and another one is a vice president at Key Bank. So you can only imagine how many resources he can tap into just with those three people alone. So a key question that I'll ask to kind of figure out the wannabe entrepreneurs and the wannapreneurs is what is it that you really want from us in the right. interview? And sometimes they'll say, well, I heard you give away $20,000 in seed grant. And then that's the, the only answer. If you only think that money is your problem, you really <laughs> <laughs> haven't done your research. And there'll be another person like this individual who comes in and says, look, money's great, but I found that it runs out because I don't know how to manage it. That's where I need you. I need mentors who can actually have relationships so I could get a food truck, maybe a restaurant, somebody who's open to pivot that says, I want a restaurant. But if I can't get it and I get a food truck, like how Lloyd started, I'm open to that. I'm flexible. So those are things, the key things that we look for when we look for those applicants because it's 15 spots. And if I get 84 applications and I have to cut, that's a lot of folks I'm saying no to. 
and that's when we refer them to those programs Marlon described. It's interesting when uh, Sonia mentioned uh, the, somebody admitting that they, they have trouble managing their money. Your your head just you just shook <laughs> vigorously. Yes, yes, yes. So, so you've you've experienced this. You've you've heard this from people. Absolutely. I think that's part of the thing um, that I like to. And, and she touched on the point of mentorship. Like mentorship looks different um, depending on what stage you look that you're in, right? Um, and I think one of the things that I love doing. Um, and that I establish is when I go and speak with a business, I'm going to come in your space. Like, I'm going to come and sit down and talk to you. I want to meet you where you are. I want to see what's going on. We're going to have multiple points of contact because I want you to feel comfortable opening up and talking to me. Um, and so that's always been my approach. Uh, and so I don't necessarily, I'm not a big Instagram guy. I'm not going to advertise too much. Like, so... Uh, I would just come find you. Like you might get an email from me. You might get. He leaves the social uh, media for the millennials me. like me. <laughs> like I'm good. <laughs> uh, but then we, we start talking about it, um, and I will start just asking natural questions. Like, what are some of the challenges that you're facing, right? And everybody talks about hiring, right? That, that I can't find the right qualified people. Uh, but then you'll hear things like, you know, I can't pay myself a livable wage, right? Like I, I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like because, you know, you hear a lot of people and people think, well, oh, my business did a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. That's great, but it doesn't mean that's what you actually pay yourself. And I think so there's just this disconnect sometimes in the entrepreneurial space where people think like, well, a hundred thousand revenue, hey, that's a hundred thousand dollars in my pocket. No, like <laughs> there's some expenses that you have to take care of. If you hire an, uh, an employee, there's some payroll things that you have to do and some payroll taxes that might go along with that as well. Well, and so when it gets down to it, you may only be bringing home 30000 and you're trying to figure out how do I increase that? And so we have those conversations um, with our entrepreneurs in a group because they're all facing the same thing, right? Like they're all going through the, uh, you know, I'm I, some people are like, hey, I, I'm bringing home enough. All my bills are paid. Some people have spouses that also have a, their own separate jobs that they can, that they bring additional income to. So they're good there. Some people are all by themselves. They're like, this is it. This is my gig. This is what I'm bringing home. I'm struggling right now. I bring home this. I then have to figure out how my insurance is going to get taken care of. If anything happens, you know, I, I'm on the brink. And so we have conversations like that on how to help people grow, how to scale their businesses um, and really take it to the next level um, where they want to go. And we understand that growth is not instantaneous uh, and success is not linear. Um, so we help them understand it's OK. Sometimes you need to step back sometimes before you can go forward. And that's OK. And when you surround people who have gone through that same process of, I had to stop, I had to cut this off. Maybe, you know, if you own a store, maybe you have too many SKUs and you're trying to keep too much inventory on hand. And maybe if you find your best sellers and do some limited additions during a certain times, but keep these main sellers on hand at all times, you might be able to streamline that process and maybe put more money back in your pocket. We have conversations like that. Um, and so it becomes very interesting to see how people when they look back, oh my gosh, the success I've made, the things that I've done, it's so amazing, and they attribute it to our group. That's mm -hmm. nice to hear. That's for sure. And mm -hmm. I'm, but when it comes to, we've been talking about entrepreneurship, obviously, it's both of your titles here, but what about the entrepreneur? Are there things that we can say about the entrepreneur, the qualities that go into that person, mm -hmm. the things that they love, the passions they have? Mm -hmm. I touched on it earlier when folks say I'm only here for the money. That's a red flag. <laughs> 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 so I start paying attention for that. I also ask, what's your why? What about the days when you don't want to go into the storefront or maybe you don't have a storefront rent and you're trying to get there? What is really motivating you? And if the reason is not there or they haven't even thought about it, they're like, huh. Well, what, what is motivating me? I thought, because I, I hate my job. That's a common answer that I, I get. I bet it is. And people think, you know, <laughs> and I've been there. I mean, the great resignation, it's what, 40 million people now that just quit? But some of those people, I'm guessing, are thinking, wait a minute, what did I just do? Right. <laughs> right. What I didn't realize is I just don't like working. Some people think entrepreneurship, it's the sexy term. And they don't realize it's a lot harder than a nine to five. A nine to five, you get to clock out and not even care about it. With your own business, you're thinking about it 24-7. You will not get sleep when you're thinking about how am I going to grow this thing? How am I going to secure this for my family? So the why is important. If it's just financially focused, that's another thing that I look for in a red flag. Things that I do think that are positive is when you come in and you say, look, I don't know. I don't know. If somebody is humble enough to come in and tell me I don't have all the answers, if I keep asking you a question and you keep giving me an answer that's not the answer and you refuse to tell me those three words, I know I'm going to have trouble when you're in my program because you know everything. Why do mm. you need me? We were just talking about profitability last night. 
and we were talking about the quick calculation, and there's nothing like seeing someone's jaw drop when you plug in those numbers in the spreadsheet, <laughs> and then they're in the red, and they swore they were profitable. And it's amazing to have those moments, but those folks that we accept usually are a lot more receptive of that. And if there aren't, then that's a separate conversation that we'll have on the side of, hey, it's okay to be wrong. It's fine. So there are a few red flags that kind of I pick up on during the interview process, but I always look for the coachability. I always look for the passion. I always look for the longevity. Is this something that you want to do long term or is this just a passion project? Because sometimes in an interview, they'll figure out, oh, wow, this isn't for me. And that's another big part of what we do is figuring out are you an entrepreneur or is this just a trend? Because it wasn't sexy in the 80s. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> it's catching steam now. And so you'll kind of weed out folks that way as well. But Marlon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, happen? I was going to say, so you're you're generally talking to people who've already gotten to a certain level of success or they're on, they've gotten their, their, their feet under them a little bit here. But what about those entrepreneurs? What are you finding inside them that might be a commonality and maybe something that uh, they're they're missing? I think Sonia touched on it. I think most of the entrepreneurs I come across, they're very humble um, about it, understanding that they don't know everything. Um, one of the questions that I love to ask them is, what does this look like in five years? Right? Like, where do you see yourself? What do you see your role with the organization? If you had all the success that you envisioned, what does it look like and what are you doing? Because I think then that makes people really have an internal dialogue with themselves of, oh, yeah, I see myself doing this or I see myself stepping away, hiring more people. OK, now we've got a vision of that we can work with. I think I think that's the best thing that um, I love about it is because because we looking we're looking for existing entrepreneurs and existing businesses. They've already kind of gone through the growing pains. Right. right. Like hopefully you, you get started like that's one and you're trying to make it to year one. And then the next milestone is can you get through three years? Right. If you can get to three years now, you've got something that's a little sustainable um, and now we can kind of help you figure out where you should be going, how to navigate that. Um, but most people, have, they already have the can-do attitude. I'm going to figure it out, right? I think you've got to have a can-do attitude. I was going to ask that. If you're going to be an entrepreneur. Generally like, optimistic people. You have to be optimistic. Right? Mm -hmm. It can't be always doom and gloom because you will just, every day will be a different day. And, and if it's always doom and gloom, then you're, you're really going to be talking so negative to yourself that, you know, you're going to, mm -hmm. I quit. I can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got to have some type of optimism there um, and just be able to, be able to recognize trends. I think that's what we help people do, recognize what's going on mm -hmm. um, and help them be able to pivot. Uh, and sometimes we catch people um, at their lowest and then you can kind of say, we need to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I catch people and I can't help them, you know, and, and that's okay too. Uh, and then it's just, hey, you need to kind of figure out what your exit strategy is going to be. Because uh, some people, and that's okay, some people want to start a business and then sell it. Right. I want to get it. I want yeah. to get it to this level and I want to sell it so and get I'm out of it. Um, so it's a big, a big right? corporation. And, and, and that's okay. And if that's your plan, right. then you need to do X, Y, and Z. And, and it's amazing when you hear people like, well, my goal is to sell it. Right. But they're doing everything. They're always involved in the business. They're, they're doing everything day to day. I'm the opener. I'm the closer. I, I'm like, you can't sell this because while you have a great brand, you're the brand. <laughs> right. You're the brand. Nobody's going to buy the brand when it's you. It's got to be something that can sustain itself so that somebody can come in and say, oh, I can own this and it's already easy for me to I can hire a new person to continue this role. But if you're doing everything and you're the face of it, that makes it difficult. And we have conversations with people like that, like you're not ready to sell this mm -hmm. as it is because you're it, you're everything. And you need mm -hmm. to kind of let go of some of the things that you're doing before you consider maybe saying, I'm ready to sell this organization. Because if I'm an investor and I look at it and I'm like, OK, well, Sonia's the face of it. Well, if Sonia leaves, the followers are going to leave and go with Sonia. So <laughs> right. then what do I have? <laughs> if I have a shell of a business, right. that's not a good investment for me. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, coming down to our final uh, couple of minutes. We're about six, seven minutes to go here. We're talking with Marlon Kerner, uh, Community Director for Entrepreneurs Forever, and also uh, Sonia Tarake, uh Program Manager for e for all Buffalo. And I want to get into a couple of things before we go, specifically, um, Marlon, for you. But we're, we're going to go to Sonia because you brought this up a little bit before about one element of some of the folks that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, a whole subset of people that we kind of forget about, mm -hmm. people who have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges there, mm -hmm. but there are pathways. 
Absolutely. So when I first got into this, there's a bakery that started this. It's called um, Open Hiring. It's a new hiring model. And basically what it is, is it eliminates the background check. Because a lot of when you're applying for these jobs, if you check that box and you don't get a call back and they say, we'll call you in two weeks, what they really mean is we don't hire ex-felons or ex-cons. Okay. But you don't know that. So if you come out and then you're, you, I, there was a, a gentleman I was talking to where he would go and he was doing all the right things. He would come to the door. He would apply. He would show up in his suit. And still, that checkbox is what was a block, no matter what position he was applying for. So you get to a point where you say, well, I guess I'm going to go back to what I was doing that got me to go to prison. Mm. So that's a huge piece of it. So about 38 percent of our applicants are previously incarcerated. And that's just a national number. And we want that number to go up. But you learn a lot of skills in prison. I know a lot of entrepreneurs having somebody was making um, pens and they were and they were using it. They said, you want to made out of wood. You want to made out of metal. And they, they were and they hid it underneath their mattress. And that's how, that was their shop. Their cell was literally their shop. And people knew to go by cell three because at these hours, because so and so was was manufacturing. So. Everything is there. It's just, are you willing to give these folks a chance? And a lot of folks aren't. So if they come through our program and we say, okay, well, you ha- you're really good with your hands. Maybe you want to open a hardware store or whatever the idea is. We're not going to hold that against you. In fact, we welcome that. So if more programs, I know certain companies, Grayson Bakery is one of them, um, the Body Shop with Shells, Candles. It's starting to pick up uh, steam in corporate, but not as much as it needs to meet the demand. So that's a huge population that we forget about. And is here in Buffalo. And oftentimes they are traditionally like three. What was the statistic? Three out of four black men are most likely to go to, to, to prison. It, it's 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 real. And that school to prison pipeline, a lot of folks in those key years get involved in things that put them on that pipeline where if we had just pulled them to the side and say, hey, there's another alternative. The problem I see is people aren't pulling them aside to say there's an alternative. And when I went to Tapestry, I said, hey, you know, they said, look, we can't pay you for this program. I said, absolutely not. I'm here to provide that for free. So if more folks would volunteer and provide those classes for free, I think we would be doing better and we would get those statistics down. But it's nice to be able to see somebody come through our program and say, I'm no longer a statistic. I love those moments. It's what I do my job for. And Marlon, now, I just want to go back to your personal story here for a little bit, because we talked about this earlier. If anyone was just joining us, Marlon uh, played uh, for the Bills uh, back in the, in the 90s, played on uh, a couple of, actually, I think the best defenses in franchise history anyway. But uh, <laughs> uh, Marlon, but we, we talked about how you, know, you, you went through, through, through college, and at that time you weren't thinking of yourself as a business. And then you go through your career, you start off, and then a knee injury brings uh, your career to an end after four years. I'm wondering if there's something inside your personal story that can be related to a lot of the people that might be listening to us right now, that what that was like, that moment, those moments when all of a sudden you had to make a change in your life that you didn't expect to come. Um, Is there, are there lessons in there that you can impart? Where to begin? So many. <laughs> I'm sorry, you only have two more minutes to go. <laughs> I think for any athlete, I think you have to go into, um, I, I don't say don't try to be a professional athlete. I think you need to make sure that you have other sk- skills that you really try to hone on and develop, right? I think any athlete, you need to understand that it's not forever. Like the NFL is the National Football League, and you've always heard the joke, not for long. <laughs> it truly is not for long. Like right. you're not going to be there forever. Uh, and so I think sometimes we we have this thing that we think that point, being a professional athlete is a career. It's just a moment in time um, and a point in your lifetime. And so if you approach it that way, I think you'll be a lot better prepared for the transition that happens because you will transition um, from the NFL um, or from the MLB or from the NBA. Um, you're going to transition and, and you're going to have to do something else. I think for me. One of the things that I was able to do was uh, I was able to really gra- I graduated, I think. Uh, and a lot of a lot of guys will have to go back and finish that. And that's OK if you have to just make sure you go back. If you went on that path, um, go back and finish that, because if you decide I don't want to be an entrepreneur yet, you're going to have to go get a job somewhere else. And you're probably going to need that college degree. Uh, and that will help you, I think. One of the other things that we do, um, and I'm, I was guilty of it, is is we beat ourselves up, right? Like if you don't have the success that you thought you're going to have in that first stage of that career, um, in that moment of time, you really beat yourself up, um, and it's okay um, to say, "Hey, I didn't achieve that success um, in this, but I'm going to find it in somewhere else." And so, if you can let go of your past, um, and as as I've learned over time, is don't let your past affect your present. 
um, you'll really be successful. Um, and, and the one thing that I would say, I said it before, is success is not linear. Um, really, it's up and down. It's back. It's a squiggly line all over the place. Um, so you just got to keep grinding. I think some of the things that you learn as an athlete, the perseverance, um, the ability to process a lot of information quickly, um, we don't think of those as skill sets that will transition and, and be really readily accessible for accessible for other jobs, but they are. Uh, and so mm -hmm. if you have somebody that you can talk to um, and help you understand, like, look, we process a lot of information. We make a lot of decisions very quickly as athletes. That's a very prime skill set that a lot of businesses are looking for. Um, and so you can go and learn something and learn where you want to go and then say, I'm going to start my business um, after the fact. Because you can go get some experience working for somebody and then transition out and start your own. Um, and that's a very good way to kind of start your business. Uh, so, mm -hmm. And if anybody wants to talk more, um, we can talk about this <laughs> August more. 24. Um, yeah, so August 24th. August 24th. <laughs> August 24th, again, the details. Yep, Simple Steps event, August 24th. It will be at 640 Ellicott Street, Dig Buffalo Innovation Center. All right, very good. Uh, we actually just got a call. A, 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 a listener just called in with a question, but we're not going to have time to get to it here, but we'll try to address it uh, offline here and maybe uh, give you your answer that you want uh, uh, online in some other mm -hmm. fashion as well. Uh, Marlon Kerner, Community Director for Entrepreneurs Forever. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Sonia Tarake, Program Manager for Eat for All Buffalo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. This has been Buffalo What's Next on member-supported WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Oleand, and WUBJ Jamestown.